up. All of us came together as Americans. Black, white, Asian, Latino, regardless of where you lived and what have you. It's my ultimate dream that we can get to that place, or more of that place, as relates to us as a country. That, you know, when you talk about the United States of America, that we care about everybody, care about everybody, care about everybody. It's now time for the David Mack Show with your host, David Mack III, award-winning radio talk show host, human rights activist, community organizer, and former chair of the South Carolina Legislative Black Caucus. So call a friend, get ready, the David Mack Show is on the air. And welcome to the David Mack Radio Show. Do not adjust your headsets. This is Daniel Mack filling in for Representative Mack. I know big difference in the voice and so on. <laughs> Y'all probably like it, can't even tell. But yes, everything is well. Representative Mack is out on business, and David James Mack IV should be back with us uh, very shortly. You know, he's a, a jet setter. He's out there traveling. So uh, I'm, but however, I'm not alone. We have a special guest in studio with us today. Uh, no stranger to these airwaves, Damon Fordham's here with us and going to be telling some special stories, um, sharing information, sharing history of Africa of all places and detail exactly where we went. I know Africa is very broad. I don't want to seem like it's just one place, but uh, just that experience. We're about to get into that and a couple other things of how it relates to us at home and, and so on. So I'm very excited about this. I'm glad I have the whole show because I have... So many questions. I'm going to be selfish. They get to ask them all by myself. Quite all right. <laughs> but before we go any further, just want to quick give a shout out to our sponsors, including Premier Medical Center with Dr. Eni Akonafu, uh, located at 5390 Dorchester Road. Uh, primary specialist, uh, my doctor, family doctor, saved the lives of several family members. Once again, I can't give a better recommendation than that. So Premier Medical Center, uh, you go see Dr. O and tell him the David Mack Radio Show sent you. Also, the Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce, uh, advancing the cause of commerce in the state of South Carolina while also making sure to pay attention to the environment as well. So we want to thank our friends and family at Gullah Geechee Chamber of Commerce. And last but not least, the friends of Jim Clyburn. We are in election season, so it's very important that you support those who help support the, the um, whether it be the Democrats or whether it be just the politicians that you support in your local area. The causes, the thing around politics. You, know, you just can't vote. That's voting is the first part, but after that, you have to make sure that there's support for the people that you voted for. So definitely look into the friends of Jim Clyburn. And speaking of election season, it is that time, and there's some important news that's come about, and we want you to take full advantage of it. But there is early voting statewide in South Carolina. So starting May 31st, you'd be able to vote from 8 a.m. until 5 p.m. And as we've said on these airwaves many times, my father's mentioned that you just can't vote everyone on the same day anymore logistically. So even with Charleston, South Carolina, and the way that we're growing, it's impossible to get everyone on the same day, especially it being a work day and, and everything else. It's just not the way it used to be. So the fact that we have this news that everyone can vote early, and for us locally, that means May 31st, it is time for us to make sure that not only ourselves, but those who might need an extra trip or those who need access to voting. We can start to plan and get the logistics done on that. So this is huge. Remember, we know there's a lot of opposition out there that's been trying to restrict the ways that we can vote. This is a way for us to actually move forward and get more people involved. This is the way that democracy is supposed to work. So um, real quick, I'm, we are going to get into everything personally with uh, you know, your recent trip, your recent travels and everything that was learned, but just talking about this early voting process, uh, what it means for you when there's been so much done lately to try and stop uh, people from voting. We know it's mainly people who look like you and I. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's nothing new. I've just written a book that will be out on July the 25th called The 1895 Segregation Fight in South Carolina, where during Reconstruction, it has to be understood that there was a time between 18, 90, 1865 and 1877 where you had African Americans not only voting in South Carolina, but there were two African American lieutenant governors, Alonzo Jacob Ranzier and Richard Howell Gleaves. And you had for four years, 1873 to 1877, the University of South Carolina was the first and only desegregated school anywhere in the South, mm -hmm. among many other things. But 
the but thanks to groups like the Klan and uh, Senator Ben Tillman and all of that, those things regressed to 1895, where they overthrew the Progressive Reconstruction Constitution and put in the Jim Crow Constitution that not only made segregation the law of the state, but it also <clears throat> all but barred African Americans from voting. Now, they didn't come right out and say that, at least in the language of it, but they put in things that making it like you had to pay $300 to register to vote. And there was a point where if you were black and tried to register to vote, you had to prove that you voted for the conservative candidates before 1876, all sorts of loopholes like that. Now, why am I telling you all this? For the simple fact that all of these things that you see now have been done before, mm -hmm. but then you had leaders like the great Robert Smalls who stood up to that sort of thing. And it's important to understand that because if you know that people stood up for that type of thing then, that will empower people to stand up for it now, which is why I write things like this for the public. Absolutely. And you said July 25th for that. That's correct. So once again, as you can see, history repeats itself. For those who don't know it, are doomed to repeat it. That's why it's important to learn about your history, and you'll be able to do that with this book that's dropping July 25th. But also you can participate in active history by making sure you get the word out that people can only early vote starting May 31st here locally. So definitely take advantage of that. Um, also, unfortunately, uh, last week since we had our show, we had that shooting at the, the Buffalo supermarket. And it uh, has some very chilling similarities to what we've experienced here locally at uh, Mother Emanuel. And uh, the thing is, actually, just speaking of international travel, I was out of the country this past week, and I was in Trinidad. And there's been several times I've been out of the country. And what's crazy is every time I'm outside the country, I've been Trinidad or Philippines several times over the years, there was always a mass shooting back home. Same here. Or, if not a mass shooting, at least there was a an unarmed black person getting killed. And there'd be people asking me, what is going on? Are they wondering like why I feel so relieved to come to this country, which may not have the same financial benefits, but I feel so much safer and overall at peace in the general public in comparison. So ultimately to kind of see that from, you know, far away, you're not in your homeland. You're just like, that's a reminder of what that's what home feels like. You can be out grocery shopping, but you always have to have this extra eye open. And I feel like that's something that we've been living with for centuries is where a lot of trauma and pain comes from. And ultimately, you talk about history repeating itself. Uh, what were your thoughts with, with this occurrence from last week? Well, I was in Africa when all that was happening, to be mm -hmm. specific, Senegal and Gambia when all this was going on. And it's kind of a matter of relativity because Whereas, you know, you, you have to admit that they have their coup d'etats and things like that over in West Africa. They, they, in, the, in those countries, the average private citizen is not allowed to own firearms. The firearms in places like uh, Gambia and Senegal are owned strictly by the police and the military. And But however, in spite of that, though, it's a relatively orderly society in that they will arrest you if you were even having a fist fight in that mm -hmm. part of Africa, and you will go to jail for such that you will go for jail for 15 years for such things as marijuana and cocaine. So, of course, and then too, it also has to be remembered that both of those countries are 90% Muslim, which, as you know, is a faith where they just simply don't play when it comes to a whole lot of things. <laughs> Now, you could argue about the relativity of whether their system is better or whether democracy is better, but I think that one thing that you would have to admit about going to a place like West Africa is that with the differences in their culture, we can learn, they can, they can, not only can they learn from us, but we can learn from them. Absolutely, because there's something, something amiss when we're in the country of so much freedom, but yet that freedom comes with the asterisk to it. Because once again, you have the freedom to, one would think, shop at a grocery store on the weekend. And we, we see these people, they're, they're just, we had, we had the, the elders of our society. We had young people. We had people from all different backgrounds that were affected by this tragedy. And once again, you have a white supremacist behind it, young indoctrinated and everybody's and then everybody once again from their family the people who knew this young man 
supposedly they're just like, well, we didn't see it coming or it must be something different. No, there's definitely definitely a wave that's been it's always been present. It never went anywhere, but it's been resurging in the last decade. And now it's hitting men when they're younger. And, you know, we have to keep an eye on this as far as what type of future we're going to have, because it's this perfect mix of people coming up in confusion of, you know, we've talked about this before, even with how the pandemic was affecting those who are coming of age. And whether it be Dylan Roof to this young man right here, I'm, I'm trying to check myself because I'm trying to say their names less because a part of it is uh, uh, anyone who does things of this particular nature, they want the notoriety that comes from it. So it's kind of hard to talk about it and report it by not giving their props. You know, I'll say the names of those who were, were victimized, such as, uh, such as, um, you know, Breonna, Breonna Taylor, something like that. I'll say their names. I'll say George Floyd. I'll say that. But I won't give the names uh, of these who do these mass shootings because the whole point is they're not only trying to, you know, they're trying to start an agenda. And they are trying to get their name out to be that they are a catalyst. You know, that's even going back to uh, John Wilkes Booth when he was trying to, when he assassinated Lincoln. He thought he was going to restart a movement. So ultimately, we have to keep our eyes on it, but it's not going to stop us. It's not going to defer us from what we need to do. And ultimately, that's what I have to say about that. But we will definitely keep our prayers with those in Buffalo and also keep an eye on what we can actively do as far as gun violence in this country and society. So at this point, speaking of country and society, you've recently left our country here of the United States and went to the continent of Africa. And I want you to Expound on the areas that you went to and uh, also the purpose behind this trip and what you actually did gain from it. And then we can get into some of the, the greater details of, of your discoveries out there. Gladly. I was part of a delegation led by Professor Donald West over at uh, Trident Technical College. Mm -hmm. Before the pandemic, he would occasionally lead these uh, entourages of people to uh, got to various countries in Western Africa. And primarily, a lot of these people were educators because, it, because it's one thing to get up and speak on Africa from what you read in a book. But the reality of Africa is so complex that you have to be there to see the people and experience the people and understand what's going on to, in its complexity that you could have any sensible explanation of it here. Then not only do you have this going on, but re uh, right now you have these characters on YouTube who are greatly misinforming the people about the reality of Africa. And I'm not talking just about how the colonizers would have you believing that Africa is filled with ignorance and savagery and all that sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But they will also, you have these clowns out there now who are brainwashing the youth who don't know any better, telling them things like, Black people didn't originate in Africa, that uh, we were here before the Native Americans, and all this foolishness and nonsense. Now, to you and me, that stuff sounds stupid, because you and I, no, well, you know <laughs> yeah, I'm a very, yeah, look, yeah. you know I'm a blunt speaker. Put it out there, yeah, yeah, put it out there. But you, to you and I, you and I grew up in educated, stable homes, all mm -hmm. right? A lot of young people out there right now have nowhere to turn. But these characters on YouTube who appeal to their emotions, but because they ha were not taught any better, they didn't grow up in homes where they read things, they are easy prey for those who would deceive them and mislead them for their own selfish gain. So it's important that people who have a real education and who've experienced things and gone places, we have a responsibility to that larger community to teach them better be because, you see, if you grow up, because if you grow up in confusion and ignorance and error, that's not going to do our community or any community any good. Not at all. Mm -hmm. Not at all. So with this particular trip, when you're talking about educators, and to me, one of the things that I just love, not only is you're looking at the continent of Africa, the birthplace of, of life, of civilization, but also mainly of, of knowledge. And that's one of the worst things it seems is happening when it comes to stereotypes across the world we've seen repeatedly in history that they always try to make it look like like black people people of color we are we were more ignorant there were always these things whether it be phrenology or just like oh we um the bell curve all these different philosophies out there just saying you know you know blacks or africans cannot match up we're uh genetically um inferior 
to, to other races. But yet, all these different things is proof of knowledge that was in the birthplace throughout, and it's all throughout the continent, signs of it. So, can you speak a little bit on that? that I'd be particular... very happy to. Now, the phrenology, <laughs> now, it's kind of, now you sort of uh, had me taken aback when you mentioned phrenology. And so, I, so I, let me explain that to the listeners out there and those who are watching this on my Facebook page live. When uh, he's talking about phrenology, that was this uh, pseudo, this fake science that came out. It was this junk science that came out in the early 1900s that said black people had smaller brains than white people. That's phrenology, okay? Mm -hmm. Where they said that you could read your head to see if you're, because of your brain size, that made you smarter, that made you stupid. And the idea was that black people had shorter, smaller brains, so thus they were stupid. And it all played into the idea that black people were good at all things physical and nothing mental. Mm -hmm. And it was important to perpetuate that because that would regulate the people to a permanent class of cheap labor. And what better way to do that than to deliberately undereducate a people and socially ostracize them to think that they were good at all things regarding dancing and singing and athletics, but of nothing involving the mind. Now, now you mentioned about uh, the origins of uh, all of this, right? Well, in each, now I often speak about, uh, are you familiar with Tahotep? I, I am. I know I've heard, I feel like one of my college professors is going to knock me down. But um, yes, please refresh my memory. I know about this, but let me not, let me not uh, compare notes with the, with the master of those right now. So if you could please educate us further on top. Well, I wouldn't call myself a master because I had to learn the stuff from somebody who was smarter than I am. So. Hey, masters submit to other masters. That's there how mastery works. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> but Tahotep was a philosopher in ancient Egypt in 2300 BC, some 2,000 years before that Greek trinity of Socrates, Plato, and Aristotle. And one of the things that he, and there's this, uh, you could easily find it online, called the uh, Instructions of Tahotep, which basically was the, was his instructions to his son before he died. So all of these things. We put ourselves in a position where we think every one thing we're really serving. Little technical difficulty there. there you go. But anyway, getting back to what I was saying. He was given instructions to his son, and today you can find that in pamphlets and on and online and such. And one of the things that he said was that, do not be proud and arrogant of your knowledge, for wisdom could be found at women at the millstones, which means every human being has gone through different experiences, mm -hmm. which means whether you are a learned person who has learned through books and studies or a person who has observed things, you know something that other people don't know, and you can learn from anybody. Absolutely. That's ancient Egypt, which is in East Africa, some 2,300 years ago. Now, taking this thing further up to our own time and to where the black Americans originated. While I was in Senegal, I, was at the, uh, I spoke briefly to the students at the University of Gambia, and I'll get to that in a minute. But in Senegal, they have this long history of great scholars that are largely unknown to the mass American public. People like that. Senegal was liberated from the French in the early 1960s by a man named Leopold Senghor. Leopold Senghor had this thing called Negritude in a magazine called Presence Africaine, the African Presence, which is where he taught the people of Senegal not to fall in for the line of inferiority that the French were trying to instill in them to use them as cheap labor, but of the beauty of Africa's past and future, so much so that when I went to this office of this great professor who I'm going to discuss, he had a picture on the wall of Leopold Senghor with President John F. Kennedy, who mm -hmm. invited him to have a state dinner in his honor. This man from Africa, the color of the bottom of my shoe in 1961, mm -hmm. he was that great of a scholar. He used his intelligence to liberate his people, okay? Now, what does this have to do with now? I was in the office of uh, Dr. Osmani Semi, Semi over in Senegal, who was another brilliant, wise scholar, and I literally sat at this man's feet while he just said all sorts of wisdom was coming out of his mouth. He was saying things such as, we have had enough of Lamentations, for Lamentations is a book in the Old Testament. We have had enough of the weeping and complaining. The way we respond is to start finding solutions to ourselves. So because he wanted a storehouse for all that wisdom in Africa, he started the uh, 
He started the West African Research Center over there in Dakar, Senegal, which I had the opportunity to visit and learn at this man's feet. And another thing he told us was that he was known as a scholar who not just kept everything to the academics and spoke in terms that the common people didn't understand, but he was on the radio, which, of course, the average person in Senegal could afford, as well as television and places where uh, the average scholar didn't reach people. So the president of Senegal wanted him to be on his cabinet. And he said, no, sir, Mr. President. And we all said, why would you say that? And he said, because the people of Senegal read me in the newspaper, and those who can't read listen to me on the radio as I try to teach the people, and I'm respected as a scholar. If I gave all that up to work for you, to spout, to spout your philosophy and how great you are, I will no longer be a scholar. I will be a liar. Mm. So major mic dropping, right? <laughs> so to sit at wisdom like this, and he told me about his how Leopold Senghor inspired him. And he only met Leopold Senghor once, but he said he set in motion the type of things in which he could become a scholar and teach people. And I often say that in the same sense that I often say I learned something from Marcus Garvey or Malcolm X or mm -hmm. Dr. King. And people say, well, wait a minute, you were just an infant when those men were killed. Yes. But I read a lot of what they said, and I take all of that to people out there who will not read those books. So, they, so therefore, I can take what I learned from their words and use that to educate people today. And that is the role of what a scholar should do. Exactly. That people should not be a stranger to that. But I, hate when, I don't understand, rather, when people say things of, well, how can this person be your mentor? Just, but they'll go to church every Sunday to worship someone they never met who lived centuries ago. So I mean, I'm just saying. <laughs> you do it on a regular basis. <laughs> you know, well, that's what they should do because, see, somebody took the time to do that with me mm -hmm. in my youth. So it's only right if I want things to continue on it to be on a better level than they are now that I do that with other young people so that they can do that for something else. Now, you heard of Marcus Garvey, right? Yes. Okay. Marcus Garvey, the great man who tried to unify black people around the world in the 1920s. When he was taken to jail in 1925, the story goes that somebody said, well, Garvey, I see they caged the tiger. And Garvey looked back and said, they may have caged the tiger, but my cubs are running loose. Mm -hmm. And the way you have to defeat a situation like what we see today is for those who are learned, who have knowledge, they have to bow. There's a, you have to understand, there's a difference between knowledge and wisdom. Knowledge is knowing things from books and study. Wisdom is what you learn from real life. It's good to have one, and it's good to have another, but it's better to have both so you can right. properly teach the people. Now, getting back to Africa. So uh, in Dakar, they also have a chapter of the University of Dakar called the Chek Anta Diop University. Mm -hmm. Chek Anta Diop was a Senegalese of a Wolof tribe, the color of the bottom of my shoe. And he was a renowned scholar of the 60s, 70s, and 80s who told the world about the greatness of the intellect of West Africa, and a lot of people at that time dismissed him as a nut, but today a lot of scientists acknowledge that he was on to something when he spoke of how you had great intellectuals in Africa long before the days of colonization. They brought that to light, so there's a statue of him in the middle of the square in Dakar, Senegal, and they named the whole section of the university after him, and I did a YouTube video on my channel, The American Storyteller, where I'm at the Sheikh Abdel Diop University uh, talking about this. And I should also add this. When I was at the University of Dakar, the students were all in the library, and guess what? You would not hear a peep out of those students because they were so serious about their work. Mm. So once again, we have this connection where a lot of times, especially when you talk about messages of trash that have been pushed forward in front of our young people as far as like blacks not being up to par ed education wise are you know the one that i hate the most like if someone speaks educated they're speaking white versus oh you don't talk black enough it's just are just you know the things that we have here in our western society that are sometimes perpetuated but yet you went to africa and you speak of this experience where everyone is loving knowledge and definitely all types so whether it be so at these schools just to kind of get specific into the studies they have what were some of the the, the, the courses and how far did it range from what you, what you saw well, now, they had a lot of things where they were working on technology as well as the history of Africa. Now, mm -hmm. I uh, also went by, with, my, with the delegation, we went by the University of Gambia, which is in Banjul, the capital of Gambia. 
West Africa. And I met um, some really fascinating people while I was over there. Uh, there was a young man by the name of uh, Seku Danso, who was uh, the, the, the uh, relations officer, who was telling me how he was deep into the study of Pan-Africanism. And for those of you who don't know, that's the idea of African unity for them to get ahead with things, sort of like black nationalism in this country. And he's a very young man at that, probably in his early 20s, and yet the students look up to him as this student organizer and such. So he asked me if I wanted to speak to one of the classes, and I said, sure. Now, and I'm going to get into this part of the discussion a little later on in the show, but while I was in West Africa, we went out in the jungles and the country areas where people were literally living in huts and all of that. And to clarify that, people tend to think of Africa in terms of one extreme or the next. They think they, you know, they, perp they perpetuate the idea that Africa is this paradise and others try to perpetuate this idea that it's a hellhole. But the reality of it is this. Africa, like anywhere else, has its good and it has its bad. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me make that clear. But even in those huts, when I was out in the villages among the Mandinka tribe and the Fulanis and all of these people, the people showered us with love and courtesy and they danced with us and they fed us. And uh, there's one video that I shot of me talking to this person out in the uh, back villages outside of back Banjul where we went for a Sunday dinner and it was just like visiting my relatives in uh, the deep country in the late 60s where all the men are outside in chairs while the chickens are running in the yard and the women are in the house talking, the children are playing around and mm -hmm. all of that. And I said that, and I told the students there, that the world, outside world may look at Africa and because of its lacking, because of poverty, which we'll get into in a minute, as well as its lacking in certain technologies and so forth, they will say that you were uncivilized. And I said, it may be true that there's poverty here. It may be true that there's some unsanitary conditions here and there, and it may be true that there's corruption, but when it comes to the way you treat people, when they come here, when they open their doors to people from who are not only in the black diaspora, but to other strangers as well, the way the average person, even in their poverty, carries themselves not as a peasant, but as a king or a queen, I said, in that aspect, you students, you here in Africa have more civilization in your pinky finger than some of us have in our whole bodies. Exactly. So while I think it's good that you accept the technology of the West, it is important that you keep your culture, keep your heritage, and all those things that make you special so you have as much to teach the world as the world has to teach you. It sounds very similar to what I heard from one of my, uh, like a personal mentor of mine, his name is Mansur Hadari. He came from Iran during the Iran-Contra affair mm -hmm. um, and kind of got stuck over here in the U.S. when everything went down with the Ayatollah in 79. But uh, he can't even go back to Iran at this moment because mm -hmm. of what he did. He would, would have been executed. But uh, it was like a whole thing from his homeland and culture. Mm -hmm. Once again, speaking of Muslim cultures, things being serious. But ultimately, well, one of the things that was told him was very similar. So I think that's a, how a lot of people view the West. They said something to him. They said, learn the, learn the skills, but not the culture. As far as exactly. when he first came over here to, to the West. So, so ultimately, just to kind of expand on that, because here we are, we're, we have a lot of people who have misconceptions about uh, the different countries within Africa mm -hmm. and what that experience would be like. But also just to speak about their view of um, African Americans, because there's always been a lot of people. And I just said, why don't you go and see for yourself rather than hearing these words or you had a bad experience in New York or somewhere else in America with someone from an African region. And they're sort of like, well, Africans don't like us. Oh, this police, stop that. man. So, ultimately. Listen. So can you expand on that? Like, I've oh, been there and I could tell you that that's a daggone lie. All right. <laughs> Now, there someone who's been there. there right. You <laughs> but, uh, but let me just say this about that. Again, part of the problem is that too many people deal in absolutes mm -hmm. when it comes to things. They think that if they have this one bad experience with one group of people, that that means that they're all that way. Or yep. because there are some bad things in Africa, that everything's bad in Africa. Or that because Shortcut there's some thinking. good things. In, <laughs> that's a good way to put it. Shortcut thinking. 
or that because some things are good in Africa that it's all a paradise. No, Africans are just like anyone else in the aspect that you have some good and you have some bad. But I love the way I was treated when I was African in Africa, as well as the, my associates who went with me, because nobody put a gun to their heads and tell them, listen, you must treat these Americans good or else. No, 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 no. They were being their natural selves. You know who I met with while I was over there? I met, among other people, I went to the Jifare village in uh, Gambia, West Africa, where I had an audience with uh, Queen Mother Aya Kinte. Mm. Now, let me, let, let me say that name again. Queen Mother Aya Kinte. Mm -hmm. Now, what does that conjure up to you when I say that last name? When Kinte. I hear Kinte, if I put Kunta in front of it, was, so was this be related to Kunta Kinte? She was, family, the, she was the eighth great granddaughter wow. of Kunta Kinte. And I had an audience with her. Wow. Ladies in her late 80s and early 90s. And she made everybody laugh because. When I went over to speak to her, and I've got pictures of this that I'm going to put on Facebook uh, in the next couple of days, she's like, oh, you handsome. You want to stay here and be my king? <laughs> and she had everybody laughing, but we got down to some serious business where we talked about the importance of the preservation of the story and culture and things like that. The Africans are taking charge of their own narrative. Mm -hmm. It's like one of the best rap songs I ever heard was um, It's Your World by Common, which I know that you're familiar with. Uh, yes. Where there's a line where his father is on there where he says something that I think sums up all of this. He said, be the author of your own horoscope. Mm -hmm. The Africans are building statues to their heroes. They're teaching their history in these schools. And they're doing what they can to preserve their culture in spite of the onslaught of a Western culture over there, but, you st but we were in the Mandinka village where not only did we get to dance with them and enjoy their food, I met the wise old chief who told us, uh, let me see, as I recall, uh, what was that chief's name? Uh, let's see, off the top of my head, uh, uh, let's see, oh yeah, Chief Laman Kisise of the Mandinkas, this dignified old man with a beard and a kufi and a robe and all of that, but yet he lost a leg to diabetes. But when he talked in that village, everybody listened. You mm -hmm. see, they respected his age and all of that. There was no people giving side conversations when he spoke. And, and so we, we saw that they, he presented to us these two boys that were going through a manhood initiation ceremony. And for those who don't know, that's where they take young boys in their late in their late tens and early teens and they go out to learn how to be a man and they get circumcised at the end of the ceremony you see and all of these things lead to a situation to what we used to have here years ago in the deep south where the community ruled the child you see mm -hmm. the children could go to any elder and the elder could say hey don't do this and don't do that and the children listen. And I saw a lot of that in these villages and these jungles and all of that in West Africa, even with people who had no electricity in their home and living in their huts in the outback. Now, while you have that going on the countryside, you have these developed cities like Dakar, which are fairly modern, but uh, in comparison to all of that, where you have these great universities. Now, the difference between Senegal and Gambia is that the French continued to pour money into Senegal after they became independent, but the British cut off Gambia after they became independent. So that's why Gambia looks a lot less developed than Senegal. But do you know what the Gambians call themselves? What's that? The smiling coast of Africa. <laughs> and everybody in West Africa who's listening to this knows exactly what I'm talking about because one thing I will always say about the African people is that they are, that in spite of what little the mass of them have because about 80 or 90 percent of them are in poverty compared to only 10 to 20 percent of them are in wealth. They are a people who do not give up. They are people with constant optimism. Even the poorest one in the hut has, is willing to go out there and sell their goods in the marketplace because they see the light at the end of the tunnel. And we, with all our advantages, a lot of us have left our situation, feed us into a diet of defeatism. And no people mm -hmm. gets ahead with that. So again, this is why I say that just as the African uh, can learn from us, they have, we have, they they can they can teach a whole lot to us 
about how to get ahead in society from what I saw. And that's definitely getting ahead because when you talk about that poverty, there's a poverty of spirit. Yes, here. and that's and the have, worst kind of poverty. Exactly, because you, you can, there's nothing that you can get outside of oneself that can end that type of poverty. Something has to be built within. And that's why I would encourage anyone, anyone, if you have a chance to travel outside of the United States, definitely do so. I'm still waiting to get to Africa. I would love to get to Africa. Um, there's so many, I definitely want to start with Egypt and then see some of these other places that, that are out there. But you've got to see something because there's, until you actually step outside of this country and see for what it is, like I, I said, it's completely different. But once again, I just by visiting Trinidad the last couple of weeks and you're seeing people who look like you and West Indians and everything mm -hmm. else and it's easy, a part of your brain, like I said, I've been there before, so it doesn't happen as much. A part of your brain looks at the differences, like, well, they don't have as many trash trucks. Their right. infrastructure is differences. Right. They're, they're lacking this here. I, you know, these are, But every day I'm working with people who are locals, and they're just as happy and proud exactly. of themselves exactly. as can be. Versus what's here within this country where we've been, a lot of it just brainwashed. Um, a lot of it, and this is an, that's an American problem, not just anything for African Americans. That's an American problem where we're going out there. Well, I, I would just say, just overall, we look at the mm -hmm. things that we don't have more so in this country versus looking at and expanding on the things that we do have. And I feel like that's where what a lot of cultures outside of the West, I feel that's where their richness, richness comes from. Uh, what is your opinion on it? Well, to a large extent, that's true, but you also have to consider this. Malcolm X said in his uh, autobiography in the chapter called Saved that about little black children who saw before they could talk that their parents considered themselves inferior. And many of us had grandmothers that told us that we were like crabs in a barrel and all of this stuff and mm -hmm. uh, that black, that, you know, if you support, you know, don't support a black business because they'll rob you every time and uh, calling people black and ugly and all these things and Martin Luther King, in a sermon that he gave in Detroit, uh, June 23rd, 1963, said that one of the most damning legacies of slavery and segregation is that instilled within the Negro in the language of that time, that they the idea that they were inferior. And the Africans, with leaders such as Patrice Lumumba and Leopold Senghor and Shankop Antediop, they basically fought hard to get that out of their people so that their mm -hmm. people can progress. Now, a little bit earlier, I was telling you about this extremely wise uh, professor, uh, this Dr. Usmani Sene. He taught for a while at Wofford College, at my home in my birthplace of Spartanburg, South Carolina. And he said that when he left that campus to go back to Senegal, the back black students begged and pleaded with him to stay because uh, he was teaching them things that they hadn't learned before. And he told them this. He said, I've already given you the tools. So whether I'm here or not, you can still go into the library yourself and find out books on Africa and African history and learn from that. And once you learn from that, he, you can go out and teach others. In other words, this, uh, this uh, Dr. Usami Seni, he was not only teaching them how to, uh, how to, get, uh, to, how to get a fish, he was how to uh, eat a fish, he was teaching them how to go out and get that fish for themselves. So before I left his company, I told him, Dr. Senny, just as you taught me here today, I'm going to go back to America and tell people what I learned from you so they can get that teaching to help improve their lives. Absolutely. Uh, one thing I wanted to add to that, because you're speaking about scholarly, um, uh, everything that was scholarly that was going on there, the college that you visit, the education, mm -hmm. everything else. What about also the political Structure. We open up Hoy talking babe. about. <laughs> we open up talking about what's going on here. We know that in recent years, or not recent years, it's just been amplified in recent years. But there's always been a struggle as far as voting rights, making sure that they're equal across the board, as the system was supposed to be designed. <laughs> and um, so, when you talk about the political structure of what we have here in the United States, what did you see over there? Just as it is. Well, in what's interesting in that, you know, of course they have problems with dictatorships and coup d'etats and things like that. Mm -hmm. But one thing that I found refreshing to see was that they get into very passionate political discussions. They are very passionate people. But the fact that they were not afraid to openly criticize their leaders, I think, was a good thing. 
-hmm. in that it showed that they were not suppressed by bad leadership. Because, for example, in Gambia, I learned that uh, there was a situation where they were going to send bulldozers out to destroy some of the shanty towns to make room for something the city planned. Well, now, the average person there doesn't have guns, right? So what did they do to prevent that? They went out there with... Uh, Get with uh, Molotov cocktails and uh, get uh, big tanks of gas, and they burn down the bulldozers. Wow. Now, <laughs> ladies and gentlemen, here's a disclaimer. I am not saying that you go out there. This is not a case where Professor Damon Fordham is telling you to go out and do mayhem or anything like that. I am using that as an example of how they basically are a people who make do with what they have in mm -hmm. order to make life better for themselves, you see. Because yeah. once you kill a person's hope, you basically are among the walking dead. And whatever you can say about the Africans, they are not among the walking dead. You can definitely say that. Uh, how many of them have an interest in the, like, what's the interest like back with the United States? Like, uh, so once again, the, the fact that you were there when this incident happened in Buffalo, mm -hmm. um, when they became aware of the news, were there any questions that he had for, for you about that? Because I'm sure well, that's just the same way we try to understand, well, hey, if you don't have some of the nice amenities that we have here, and certain people can't imagine that, I'm sure they can't imagine the paranoia and type of fear that can happen in our society where you're not safe in a grocery store or a church. Well, no, I mean, things happen there, too. Don't get it okay. twisted. Yeah. I mean, you, you have, have this type of thing going on in every country, but... You, growing up here in Charleston, you remember this expression the old folks used to say about they're free till they're full? Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what their view of us is. They feel that Americans... See, their view of democracy is that if you give the average person too much leeway, it will be abused. Or it was sort of an African version of the British saying by Lord Acton that absolute power corrupts absolutely. And so... They feel that we have too much license in this country. And then you have, because these you have to remember now, these are people who grow up now in Senegal and Gambia, 90% of the people are Muslim. Okay, they are, they're only 10% Christians. And curiously enough, you know one thing that I did not see in any of the Christian churches or in the icons of where I was? What's that? I didn't see any black Jesuses. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> now... But having said that, you have these different tribes like the Mandinka, the Wolof, uh, the Fulanis, and so forth. But in spite of the differences in tribes and religions, at least in the countries where I visited, you see no conflict among that. In their societies, Christians marry Muslims all the time, and there's intermarriage among the tribes and all of that. So they have a lot of peaceful coexistence there, which again, we can learn from, get this, Christians see no problem in celebrating the Il Ad Fatur, which, uh, if you know anything about Islam, is the celebration they have after Ramadan, which they do their fasting and all that, when they break their fast. Mm -hmm. Christians go in for those celebrations, and Muslims also celebrate Christmas with Christians. Wow. Because, again, they just see these things as, as happenstance, as my being left-handed or wearing glasses. The difference in tribes and all of that means nothing, at least in those countries. Let me make that clear. Now, while we're on the subject of tribes, I was, uh, one of the things we did, we stopped in the Fulani village near the border of Senegal and Gambia. And we, and so while we were with the, we were with these people, I noticed that they were pointing at me and saying, Wolof, Wolof, Wolof. And I'm like, what are they talking about <clears throat> now? We had this really excellent guide with us who really made our stay great by the name of Se of Seku Kasama, okay? Mm -hmm. He was a uh, Mandingo from Gambia, but he spent, he did a lot of work in Senegal. So, I, so to just put it out there, I was the darkest guy among our, our delegation. And he pulled me aside and I noticed these uh, tribesmen are pointing at me, Wolof, Wolof, Wolof! And I'm like, what's this about? And so he pulled me aside and he says, they think that you're of the Wolof people, and they're surprised to hear you speak English and be with the Americans. <laughs> so after we feasted and fellowshiped with them, I got up and I told them through uh, the translator Seiko Kasama that uh, I see that many of you think that I am a Wolof. Well, I said, I may be. I don't know. I'm an American, but uh, 
I would just like to say that I am that with the hospitality you have shown us, I am as happy to be claimed by you as happy as I am to claim you as my people. And so that was beautiful. Now, all throughout my stay after that, people kept say, coming up to me thinking that I was of this uh, Wall-Off group, right? But let me get real deep with you. When we went to the universe, to the uh, uh, Black Civilization Museum in Dakar, which is a museum where they see to it that the people know of their greatness, they had, we had this uh, docent, tour guide, beautiful young girl out of the University of Dakar. She's so a sophomore student. And she was eloquently speaking of the history of how humans originated in Africa. And so Sekou went over to her and whispered something and pointed at me. And she had this shocked expression. She said, and he said, Professor, can you come here for a moment? And I said, sure. And, she, and so he pointed to, told the young lady, they meet your American Wolof brother. Professor Fordham, this is your Wolof sister. And You know, the, I want. That's one of the reasons I wanted to ask yeah. you about this trip because when you talk about the the, the personal connection to it, I, I went with you in 1999. Nine. Yeah. On the you know the, the civil rights tour, where do we go from here? Mm -hmm. Planned by Carlos of Charleston, and we went to some really emotional spots, whether it be the um, the site of the, the um, Birmingham church, right, four girls were bombed. Um, Selma. Yeah, in, in Selma, visiting the Lorraine Motel right. in Memphis, where there's now a museum to commemorate the spot where MLK was assassinated. Um, we went to the, the bowling alley right. where the Orangeburg massacre. massacre. Yes, all, all these things, and it was emotional. Even at, at the age of 18, I could kind of feel it, but even at that point, I, hadn't, I didn't have enough wisdom. Like, I appreciated it, but as I gain more wisdom, mm -hmm. I go back and appreciate it even more. To this day, and you know, and it does bring emotions up. Man, I couldn't keep a dry eye watching the movie Selma, and you know, we we walked the Edmund Pettus Bridge, and and now I got to meet there the the black mayor they had there, mm -hmm. and as well as uh the black mayor in Stone Mountain. That was that was just a wonderful trip in emotional different ways. So what it also mean to you? And this is just a post I saw on your Facebook social media as well too. The, the, do the point Glory of no Island, return. the door of no return. Yes. Well, let me conclude that last story by saying that the young lady did email me and uh, back, and I did email her in return saying that I wanted to get her mailing address so I could send her my books, and I agreed to send copies of my books to the University of Gambia as well as the University of Dakar. But, every, but you know, Richard Pryor used to do this gag about how everywhere he went in Africa, I saw somebody he knew. <laughs> and that's definitely the same thing here. And they're not all about my complexion either. There were a lot of, uh, you know, brown to lighter skinned Africans who looked like people who I knew that uh, may have had some mixture in their family also. So that's another thing I want to put out there, too, too, because, you know, a lot of people just have that singular idea of Africans and such. But now, having said all of that. Yes, Gore Island was the slave, one of the slave port islands, and it was the best known of them. And it was uh, used about, the Portuguese started that around 1443, and it's strategically located at the furthest western tip of West Africa, so that it was the shortest distance between that and North and South America for easier access for the slave trade. So they take you in this castle where uh, they have these people uh, chained and all of that. And what would usually happen was this. At that time, you had warfare between the chiefs and kings and such. And the difference is a king rules over a larger area, and the chiefs are under the king, sort of like you'd have uh, one president and 50 governors. Mm -hmm. It's the same. That's the difference between the king and the chief. So anyway, uh, they would, of course, go to these kings and chiefs with guns and, t and say, look, this will give you superiority over that other group for your war captives. And so that's kind of how this sort of thing worked out pretty much. Now, there were people such as King Ose Tutu of Ghana and Queen Nzinga of Angola who, and Ya Asantewa who fought against this type of thing. Not all of them did that, all right? 
So, mm -hmm. you, again, there's a balance with this. But in either case, when you walk through that door of no return, it hits you like a baseball bat. If you walk away from that without sobbing or crying or uh, passing out or regurgitating or whatever and all, if you walk out there with no response, I'd be afraid of you. <laughs> because you just can't be human. And look at how that door was the last place where those people walked out in chains toward those ships where they would never see their friends and family again into a total strange land. If that doesn't affect you, I don't know what will. Yeah, I've, I've seen it on TV before and even seeing those pictures, it just brings something back. And it's one of those things where as painful as it is, we, we need it. I agree because with once that. Again, if, I agree you don't, with that. if you don't learn from it, then that experience, everything we went through those experiences, it was all for nothing. Exactly. So, so you pay tribute to it. And those are the people who brought us here. That, that's, that's right. Somehow, some way or another, it links us back to those people. And they were, someone was brave enough, strong enough, mm -hmm. had the will enough to survive. And once again, to this day, that is why we are here in America. And that is, goes back to uh, when your father and uh, Wendell Gilliard introduced me face to face with uh, Jesse Jackson on his birthday about uh, three or four years ago, back when he was still pretty <clears throat> lucid and all of that. Mm -hmm. I reminded him of the time when he came to Charleston when I was 14 years old, and he said something that stuck with me to this day. He told us that it was a sin to do less than your best. And when you think of what these people went through when they were snatched out of greed and put on chains and marched into through that very same door that I stood in the doorway of to go through all of this, if you don't do less than your best, and do the best that you can do in this society. And that is such a dishonor to what those people went through that you should be ashamed of yourself. So you should use those type of things that they went to to take advantage of what you have now and learn from that and move forward to a better future. You know, we have a few minutes left. And one of the things I wanted to ask, we talked about misconceptions, clearing up certain things, but there is a... There is a number of people growing, and I got to consider myself included when I look at all these things who are looking at possibly moving to Africa or looking to certain places outside the country. And they're just saying, <laughs> well, and, but the only thing is, I said, if, if I were to even look into something that nature, it's just like, I want to have the right mindset. Now, the thing is, ultimately, what I've learned since 2020 about myself, it, you know, there are certain conveniences and challenges, you know, there's certain conveniences I'm willing to give up. Certain challenges I know going to a new place, I have to face. Because as you said, nothing's perfect. And don't expect it's going to be, oh, mm -mm, going to be there. No, not. good Lord, But no. it's about what, to me, it's more about what are you willing to, to fight for. And at least, if nothing else, certain areas it seems clear. Yeah, there's some major challenges, but not to go over there and make it look like, like, like that balance between how much do you want to improve it but not make it look like anything you came from, but how much rather would I have to assimilate with going over there? So that's one of those things. I don't take it lightly, and I, I'm hoping that any people I've heard this from have discussed it, but what would you say to anyone who's saying, I, I, you know, if I were to move out of the country and I were to look at going home because of the love and appreciation I feel there, where are some certain things you would think that they should consider? Let me say this. Okay, first of all, okay. You know, even Marcus Garvey, who uh, propagated a lot of the back to the Africa idea in the uh, 1900s, mm -hmm. said that some of us are no good here and some of us will be no good <laughs> over there. And the Africans themselves will tell you that. You know, if you come there knowing nothing about their culture and thinking that just because you're an American that you have superiority over them, stay back here. Okay, no, I'm, de no, I'm dead serious. Yeah, I'm that's dead true. serious. If you, because see, you have to have a mindset that is educated to Africa and that is, up, that is open to the fact that these people know their culture better than you do, okay? Mm -hmm. And if you don't have that type of mind, if you go out there without that type of mindset, you just might as well forget it. The bottom line is this. You know, this is, a, this is what you call the grass being greener on the other side of the fence. Some people think that because they're going to be there in these black run countries that everything's going to be okay and you have Africans over there who want to come here because they believe that with our material success things are better over here. It's all about 
perspective and reality. There are some over there who could come here and do well. There are some over here could come, could go there and do well. But at the present time, as far as us doing that over there, that there are people who I know personally. There's a gentleman in Sierra Leone known Chief, named Chief O'Day who's doing quite well in Sierra Leone and trying to build up a sort of pan-African network. But that's not the majority right now. Mm-hmm. You know, my best, my, the thing about that is if you go there, go with somebody who knows the area, who knows what they're doing, and who understands the people. Because if you go there cold, you will be lost. Because that is a different world and a different culture altogether. Absolutely. It's a lot of changes you have to get used to. And speaking of going back over there, did, you didn't take up uh, uh, Miss, uh, I want to put respect on the name, Miss Ku- Miss Kinte. When she says she was going to be a king, no. you, you didn't take up on that offer? Uh, listen, listen, Just listen. Just give a quick hug in the no, kids. That, so like, hey, listen, on, she's, <laughs> listen, that lady's in her late 80s, okay? I mean, she gave a little no, wink and laugh when she said that. But um, even with, with all of that, as I said before, you know, I, I'm, going, I'm probably going to go back in 2024, but I've got too much work here to do yeah. with getting people to sort of clean their minds of a lot of these type of negative things to begin with. I've got a lot of work to do over here now. From time to time, I'm going to go over there. I'm going to maintain my contacts over there because they, I have an invitation to do an African radio show. I'm going to write some things for their newspapers and all of that. I'm going to continue to maintain my connections over there. But you know, it's like uh, back about the year before I went to uh, Alabama with you, there was the father of one of the four little girls, um, Christopher McNair. I was with Clay Middleton and an audience with him. And somebody asked him, why didn't he leave Birmingham? And he gave a very good answer to that. He said, if my house is on fire, am I going to go somewhere else to put it out? Mm. And I'm going to leave that right there. Talking about a mic drop right there. <laughs> my house is on fire. Am I going to, going to go to another house to put it out? So I love also, as you said, there's work to be done. And there's definitely work to be done. And the biggest thing is that we just need to start with it. So on behalf of Brother Fordham, we want to thank you. We just want to thank you for joining us today and giving us that knowledge. We know that uh, until you come back, which won't be too long, we can't go too long without having you on here. Uh, once again, brother, we just want to thank you. You're very welcome. Absolutely. Um, Representative Mack should be back by next week. You know, I'll be keeping moving over here. And if not, you know that you'll be joined by either myself or David James Mack the fourth. One of them, Davids or Daniels and Max, is going to be here <laughs> running the show for you. So we thank you all for listening. Please join us again next week. Uh, as we, and also be on the lookout for the David Mack Radio Show Facebook page for any updates as well. We thank you for joining us this week. Look for you next week. As always, thanks for listening. All right. <laughs>